In the summer of 1948, a very unique aircraft took to the sky, or rather, was dropped into the sky. This was the McDonnell XF-85 Goblin. It was one of America's attempts at creating a so-called parasite fighter, and as far as designs go, it's one of the weirdest planes to be flown by any US pilot. During World War II, the huge formations of American bombers were protected by long-range escort fighters. As bomber technology developed and their effective range increased, the fighters could roughly keep up thanks to the addition of drop tanks. However, with the emergence of the first generation of jet fighters, there came a problem. They lacked the range to keep up with any of the heavy bombers. For reasons that usually involved explosions, aerial refueling wasn't quite far enough along in its development to facilitate that line of thinking, and so the US Army Air Force considered reviving the idea of the Parasite Fighter. These aircraft had seen some use in the 1930s and during the earlier parts of the Second World War, mostly by the Soviet Union. The United States had also dabbled with the idea of parasite fighters, but development work had been discontinued before their entry into the war, owing to the improved range of conventional planes. But, as the aforementioned new generation of jet fighters now had considerably shorter range, the concept was once again appealing enough to consider. And so, in early 1944, the Army Air Force directed the Air Technical Service Command to undertake studies on the idea, and invited industry manufacturers to submit concept proposals. Unfortunately, they didn't get many responses. Most manufacturers were busy producing conventional aircraft, or working on what they considered more promising projects, and many believed that the Parasite Fighter was a dead-end road in terms of development. This proved to be fortuitous for the relatively young McDonnell Aircraft Corporation, who were keen to expand their portfolio, as they were the only aircraft manufacturer to respond with enthusiasm. That being said, their initial proposal, the Model 27, was not well received. Unfortunately, no drawings of this aircraft seem to exist, so here's a pretty photo of a B-29 for the time being. Designed by a team led by Herman D. Barclay, the Model 27 was a small but rather conventional fighter that was meant to be carried partially within the belly of said B-29, or the newer and upcoming B-35 or B-36. However, the Model 27 was rejected in 1945, as the Army Air Force concluded that such a design would cause too much drag, and it was decided that any parasite fighter must be contained completely within the B-35 or the B-36. The B-29 at this point was removed from consideration, as it was deemed, hilariously, too small. Undaunted, McDonnell completely revised its parasite fighter design, and on the 19th of March 1945, submitted a proposal for the Model 27D. It was a diminutive aircraft with an egg-shaped fuselage, triple vertical tail surfaces, a tailplane with a pronounced anhedral, and vertically folding wings with 37 degrees of leading edge sweep. It was to be powered by a Westinghouse J-34 turbojet, and it was to be armed with four 50 caliber machine guns mounted in the fuselage. Also, as a quick side note here, the wing sweep of this design was pretty adventurous for the time, as it both predated the acquisition of German engineering data post-war, and North American's recommendation for redesigning the original straight wing XP-86. The only other major developer of swept-wing aircraft at the time had been Northrop, with their XP-56 and the XP-59. McDonnell's proposal for their new Parasite Fighter was received favourably, and in spite of the post-war gutting of military aircraft orders, they received an order for a static test model and two prototypes tailored for use with the B-36 on the 9th of October 1945. A wooden mock-up of the prototype was built in 1946, this included both a mock-up of the Model 27 and a modified version of the B-36 Bombay that would house it. The Army Air Force conducted an inspection in June, after which the mock-up was accepted, with only minor modifications recommended to the oxygen stations in the Bombay, and McDonnell began construction on the two prototypes in the latter half of 1947. Initially, the Model 27D was redesignated as the XP-85, 
but in 1948 this was changed to XF-85 and the aircraft was given the name Goblin by the Air Force, though some McDonnell personnel gave it the more affectionate nickname of Bumblebee. In parallel with the development of the XF-85, the Army Air Force, which in September 1947 became the US Air Force, planned that the 24th and subsequent B-36s would be capable of carrying one F-85 plus a bomb load, while some of the bombers would be modified to carry three fighters with no bomb load at all as a sort of floating aircraft carrier. Providing the test results of the two prototypes proved favourable, the US Air Force were prepared to place an initial order for 30 of the F-85 Parasite fighters. As far as designs go, and as a direct result of its unusual requirements, the XF-85 was almost as far away from a traditional fighter design as it was possible to be in the late 1940s. Indeed, almost everything about this plane can be considered weird in one form or another. In terms of operation, the XF-85 was designed to be launched and recovered from a retractable trapeze that would extend beneath the parent bomber. As a result, the XF-85 was not fitted with an undercarriage, but had a retractable hook in the fuselage, set forward of the cockpit, and for emergency landings it had a retractable steel skid beneath the fuselage, and its wingtips were protected by small steel runners. For moving the Goblin on the ground, a special four-wheel transport dolly was built that allowed it to be transported from the hangar to the mothership or other testing facilities. As it would spend most of its time nestled in the steel bosom of a strategic bomber, the XF-85 only needed a combat endurance of 30 to 40 minutes. This meant that only a small 420 litre fuel tank was required, though compared to the total size of the airframe, this would still take up a considerable amount of space. In fact, the arrangement was so compact that the centre of gravity would move several inches during the course of a flight as the fuel tank was drained. There are also some sources that give the fuel capacity as 720 litres, but for the moment I'm more inclined to go with the lower figure as that seems to be the more dominant amongst various source materials that I could find. In terms of aerodynamics, the short length of the XF-85's fuselage reduced the effectiveness of the tail surfaces, and so McDonnell grew inventive with the flight control layout. To keep the XF-85 stable, more tail surface was needed, but having one or two very large tail sections would A. present all kinds of terrifying drag problems, and B. prevent the aircraft from fitting in the bomb bay of a B-36. In the end, five stabilising surfaces were mounted around the rear of the plane. Four were arranged in an X pattern, with the fifth as a vertical stabiliser. Continuing with the trend of weirdness, there was no traditional rudder on said vertical tail section. Instead, four so-called rudder vators were mounted on the other four stabilisers, which combined the functions of conventional rudders and elevators. These operated in pairs, with the upper right and the lower left working together, and vice versa. Though in an unusual departure to normality, there was nothing special about the control surfaces of the main wings, which had conventional ailerons for roll control. The trapeze system was equally unique as the fighter it was designed to carry. It had three sections, the upper two sections were hinged to hold the XF-85 level as the mechanism was extended, and a pincer-like stabilising arm was mounted at the forward end of the lower portion to restrain the movements of the fighter whilst it was still attached. The trapeze mechanism was removable, and McDonnell was directed to ensure that it would take no more than 12 hours to remove the system and allow normal use of the B-36's bomb bay. The whole system was designed to launch the XF-85 from the parent bomber in less than two minutes once the bomb bay doors were open. To launch the fighter, the trapeze would fully extend, the pilot of the XF-85 would lower the wings and lock them in position and start his engine. The trapeze operator aboard the bomber would then release the pincer arms that kept the fighter in place. And finally, the pilot of the XF-85 would flick a switch that unlocked the head of the skyhook and the fighter would drop free. By the summer of 1948, the first prototype was almost ready for flight trials. Unfortunately, some butterfingers resulted in it being dropped in one of NACA's wind tunnels, 
damaging the nose, intake, and lower fuselage. And after a relatively short delay, the second prototype was hastily readied for use instead. Initial flight trials began on the 23rd of August. However, as no B-36s could yet be spared for testing, the XF-85 would be carried aloft by a specially modified B-29 Superfortress. This had a cutaway bomb bay, complete with the trapeze installation that was intended for the larger B-36. The first three test flights were simply captive flights, with the XF-85 performing the parasite part of its role to admiration and clinging onto the trapeze of the B-29 without incident. It was also lowered down into the airstream with its engine turned off to give the test pilot a feel for how it handled in the air. Piloting the Goblin was McDonnell test pilot Edwin Schock. He would be the only person to fly the XF-85, partly because he was one of McDonnell's best and most prolific test pilots, and partly because the aircraft's size meant that it couldn't be flown by anyone over 5'8". After the first three captive flights were completed without incident, Schock was ready for the first free flight of the Goblin. This was made on the 28th of August, when at an altitude of 20,000 feet and flying above the Muroc Dry Lake, the modified B-29 evicted its parasite and Shock took the XF-85 for a 15-minute flight to evaluate its handling characteristics. Despite looking like a squashed melon with fins stuck on the side, the XF-85 was reported to be surprisingly stable, and it responded quickly, but not dangerously, to the controls. Indeed, it handled so well that it could almost come as a surprise that the project was cancelled. But then came the moment of reattachment. Hooking onto the mothership was perhaps one of the most terrifying things that any pilot could experience in 1948. On its own, lining up the skyhook with the trapeze was difficult enough. As mentioned before, the controls were somewhat sensitive. But then there was the added problem of the incredibly turbulent air beneath the parent B-29. In the process of reattaching, the XF-85 was caught in this violent turbulence and struck the trapeze with such force that it shattered the canopy and ripped off Shock's helmet and breathing mask. Thankfully, he managed to regain control of the aircraft and safely performed an emergency landing on the dry lake bed below, but it was a worrying start. Following its repairs, the prototype made three more flights on the 14th and 15th of October 1948, with successful recoveries using the hook and trapeze. However, each of these attempts required the full concentration and effort of an experienced test pilot to avoid disaster. And on the fourth flight, Shock had to again make another emergency landing, courtesy of the severe turbulence. Notwithstanding the addition of auxiliary vertical surfaces at the wingtips to improve directional stability whilst flying through the turbulent air, the sixth flight also ended with a landing on a dry lake after another heavy impact with the trapeze. The same fate also awaited the first prototype, when on its first and only flight, it also headbutted the mothership and had to commence an emergency landing. In spite of this, the favourable comments regarding its stability, control and spin recovery prompted McDonnell to remain confident about the XF-85, and it was hoped that a redesigned trapeze system might make the docking process easier. To Air Force personnel, however, it was obvious that even with major improvements, the Goblin was still going to be quite the handful for the average pilot, as even the best will in the world couldn't magically make the prop wash of a B-29, let alone a B-36, simply disappear. This, combined with the waves of funding reductions that began in the autumn of 1949, made it increasingly difficult to justify further development work on the XF-85. The final nail in the coffin was the realisation that foreign interception fighters were now in development with performance figures that far outclassed the XF-85. And so, after accruing just 2 hours and 19 minutes of flight time, McDonnell received a termination notice for the XF-85 programme. Thankfully, for aviation enthusiasts everywhere, these aircraft did not go to the scrap heap. The first prototype is on display at the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Ohio, and the second is on display at the Strategic Air and Space Museum in Nebraska. Their survival can partially be owed to their extreme uniqueness, 
but also to the fact that lessons learned from their development were applied to the development of the Republic RF-84K Thunderflash, which itself saw limited use as a parasite reconnaissance aircraft as part of the FICON program. But that is a story for another day. As always, thank you all very much for watching, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.